Okay, dear subscribers and viewers, I have the message that I want to share with you, and uh, it is from Pastor and Professor Walter Veth. So let us come and see, because it's a part of me watching, but it's part also of you watching. And then I believe at the end of this video, you get the point which you can share with others concerning the prophets. The issue is for us to watch and share the knowledge. So I welcome you for this part of the video. May God bless you. Amen. Because we spoke about the judges and, the, and what it was like to live under a theocracy. And the people wanted a king. And God, in his gracious way, even went along with their, excuse me, stupid plan to want a king. And they condemned us <laughs> to this day to be under all of these kings that do everything that God predicted they would do. They were such painful kings. But each one of these kings of Israel was a type. And they served as, as instructions for the house of Israel. And even though some of them were wicked, there were aspects that represent the king in his beauty. And so when we talk about the kings, when they asked for a king, there are some interesting characteristics that come out in this, in this event. We read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And it came to pass when Samuel was old, he was the last judge. And the sad thing about this was that Samuel was the most upright of all the judges. He was fair to the nth degree. He was spiritual to the nth degree. He was kind. He was generous. He had all the attributes that anyone could wish for. And exactly in his time, they asked for a king. It's unbelievable. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the first one was Joel, the firstborn, and the name of the second was Abiah. And they were judges in Bathsheba, and his sons walked not in his ways. But turned aside after lucre, they were money grabbers. They took bribes and perverted judgment, which seems to be the order of the day, especially if you come like from countries like I come from. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They really think that was going to be the solution? Who said the king was going to walk in, in Samuel's ways? Like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel. And when they said, give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord, he was distraught. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Well, the kings of the world lorded it over the people, and now the Israelites wanted to be like the nations around them. And they got what they wanted. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So he gives them another opportunity. He says, okay, you can listen to them, but explain to them exactly what it will entail, and see what they say then. <laughs> 
Amazing. Verse 10, chapter 8. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariot. And I'll put them in the army. And I will kill a million of them. Or two million, or three million, or four million, or five million, or ten million. They were so scared that God would rule. And the amazing thing is, sometimes God did actually intervene in the affairs of Israel. And he rebuked his people. And he would uh, send situations where some of them would be destroyed. Plagues and uh, all kinds of retributive actions to, to bring the people to their senses. And sometimes in these situations, 20,000 died, or 23,000 died, or 30,000 died. And then the next verses would say, and there was peace for 80 years. Excuse me. That's a long time. That's two generations. Peace. Why? Because when God removes certain people out of the society, he at least knows who to remove. All the troublemakers were gone. When the kings of the world remove the people out of the world, all the good guys are gone and all the troublemakers remain behind. There's no peace ever. No peace. They wanted a king. Okay, so they could die in their millions and the jails could be filled with good people and the streets roam with wicked people. Okay. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and he will set them to ear the ground and to reap the harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards. Now, just think about all of those things and think, make a spiritual application. What is the field in the Bible? Remember the treasure? The pearl without price? The great treasure? Where, where, where was the great treasure hidden? It was in the field. And the field is the word of God. So he'll, he'll take the word out of your mind. You'll become secularized. And he'll take your vineyard. He'll destroy your church. And he'll take your olive yards. He'll remove the workings of the Holy Spirit in your mind. And if we look at the way in which the secular world is ruled, is there any room for anything spiritual in what they do? Unbelievable. They wanted a king. Even the best of them. And give them to his servants. In my country, they're doing it literally. They're taking the fields and the vineyards and the olive yards and taking them literally away without compensation. No compensation. We'll just take it. The Bible calls that theft, thievery. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyard, and give it to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servant and your maid servant and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and he will take and you shall be his servants. So I'll take a tenth of that, 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 and a tenth of that, and how much is left for me? Nothing. Fascinating. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. So the people said, okay, we get the message, we don't want the king. Right? No. No. 
Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Why is it that people can be so stubborn and so obstinate? The most stubborn and obstinate people on the planet are the people in the Lord's church for some strange reason. I don't know why it is so. Yet we have to love them. That we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. How great was Saul at fighting the battles? Sitting there, quaking away. When they could have had God who sends angels from heaven and hail and hornets and who knows what to obliterate the enemy. No, they wanted a king. And it's just the same today. We want to be like everyone else. We want to rule like everyone else. We don't want to be like God wants it to be. God gives so much freedom. And he's so fair. He takes one-tenth of what you have and leaves you 90%. But not these kings. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. And then we get to chapter 9. And then we have the story of the first king. And it's a very interesting parallel. The attributes of this first king. And this first king, although he here is chosen as a type of the great king who rules in heaven and has some of the attributes of the great king who rules in heaven, he actually becomes apostate and becomes a type in the end of Satan. And then you have, in contrast, the next king that is chosen, and that is another type. And we'll contrast these two because they are really quite fascinating. Chapter 9, verse 1. And there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. Okay, so Benjamin was the smallest tribe. And if we go to the book of Revelation we'll see that uh, little Benjamin is mentioned last. Not in order of birth, but in order of rank. So he comes out of the lowest rank of the churches. Revelation chapter 7. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So this has to do with a cognitive decision that you make, a sealing in of the truth. To be sealed means to be so settled in the truth that you cannot be moved. And then it mentions those that are sealed. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. And there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And the first one mentioned, although it is not the firstborn, in other words, the first one in order of rank of the tribe of Judah, were sealed 12,000. Then of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. And it goes through them, Aser and uh, Nephilim and Manasseh and Simeon and Levi and Issachar and Zebulon. And at ends of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. So Benjamin represents the lowest denominator. And Judah represents the highest denominator. And sandwiched between the two, you have every aspect of spiritual Israel. The lowest stands for the base metal. 
It stands for the natural man. The highest, Judah, where you have the tribe of Judah bringing forth the lion of Juba, Judah, stands for the spiritual man. And between these two, you have this interesting comparison. And of course, the next king was David. And he was from the tribe of Judah. So between those first two kings, you set the, the standards and the benchmarks of what the mindset, the sealing of the mind entails. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel. Abiel is interesting because it means Abba is father, El is God. So it means Father God. The son of Zeror. The son of Bekorot. The son of Aphiah. So four generations are listed. Four is the number of humanity. A Benjamite. A mighty man of power. So Kish is described as a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From the shoulder, mentions the shoulder first, and upwards, that entails the head, he was higher than any of the people. So if he is a type here, it represents another one who is also higher than anyone else and has uh, government on his shoulders. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. This is interesting. Saul, the name actually means asked of God. So here is a lineage, Kish being a mighty man of valor, and he has a son asked of God. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go to seek the asses. So when we look at this origin, he comes from the tribe of Benjamin, representing the lowest denominator, the natural man with the natural tendencies. And the next king, he was the caretaker of sheep. So what do the asses and the sheep represent? So the asses were lost. So in a sense, we could say spiritually that the moral virtues of the natural man had been lost. Sheep represent a spiritual aspect. It represents the, the higher virtues. The shepherd representing God, the spiritual aspects. And so now let's have a look how he goes and searches for his asses. So the asses of Kish Saul's father were lost, and Kish said to his to Saul his son, take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, that was the largest tribe's territory, and he passed through the land of Salisha, which means three things, but they found them not. Then he passed through the land of Shalim, and Shalim is a reference to a pagan deity, probably Venus, the goddess. And there they were not. You will not find virtues in any of these places. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Suf, Saul said to his servants that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. So it doesn't say that he passes through the land of Suf. It just says he comes up to it. 
Now, Suf was the name of one of the sons of Elkanah, and Elkanah was also the father of Samuel, and Samuel happened to live in the land of Suf. So before he gets to the higher virtues, he says, no, 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 let's go back. We can't find the asses anyway. And what happens then? And the servant says to him, Behold, there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he has surely comes to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. So maybe this man can tell us where we can find the asses, where we can find the lost virtues of humanity. He didn't want to go there. He was not a spiritually minded man, Saul. He wanted to turn back. But a servant said to him, no, 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 just go a little bit higher. Who's that servant? Who should it be? Shouldn't we all be servants to the kings today? Shouldn't we all preach a message that says to the kings today, come a little higher. I have something for you. Come and go and have a look. But then he says, well, what shall we bring? What shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels. You see, it was custom in those days that if you visited the king, you would take something special. What did David bring to the king when he came to visit the armies when he was confronting Goliath. He brought ten loaves of bread. But they had no bread left. And there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? He's bankrupt. He's got nothing. What shall we bring? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold... I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. Again, you have the number four, which stands for this earth and what is happening on this earth. And he has the fourth part of a shekel. So he doesn't even have enough for the redemption money. He only has a quarter of a shekel. He should have half a shekel at least per person so that he could pay the redemption money. But he doesn't. But he says, a fourth part of a shekel, that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. So even with the virtually nothing that they have, they can proceed. It is enough. So beforehand in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spoke, come and let us go to the seer for he that is now called a prophet was before called a seer and said Saul to his servant, well said. Okay. So sometimes even someone who is earthly minded might heed that word of the servant which represents the servants of God saying, okay, let's go and do it. And they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. What does that remind you of? Young maidens. Well, the maidens represent the church, and they're drawing waters from the well of life, springs of living water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now. For he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. So through the operations of the church, God directs the worldly minded to a higher level. And as soon as you come into the city, you shall go straightway Find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come. There's nothing to eat unless there's the word of God, spiritually speaking, 
You cannot eat until you go there. They didn't have any more bread. They didn't have any more spiritual food. They'd lost the virtues. They couldn't even find the asses. And they were looking for them. Is there any hope of the restoration of the asses? Now therefore get ye up, for about this time he shall come. Get ye up. And then you can draw from the wells of salvation where the maidens are scooping and offering it as a drink. And they went up into the city. Notice how it's always up when it's spiritual things. And when it's non-spiritual, it's always down. Always down. And then they were come up into the city. Behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now in the early time of the judges, all sacrifice was done on a high place. That's where you went. Because that represented the upper echelons, the higher virtues. But because it became corrupted later and associated with heathenism, God actually later forbade them to go and sacrifice in the high places. And they had to have special sites where they had to build special altars out of unhewn stones where they would offer. But in the time of Samuel, it was still done on the high places. Up. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people, Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. So he's, he's using this king, even though he comes from the lowest tribe, He's lost the asses. He's searching for them. He can't find them. He still makes him a type of the great king who will save his people from the Philistines, the anti-typical Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because of their cry that has come up to me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man. Have you heard that somewhere in the Bible? Who else said, behold the man? Wasn't it Pilate? Pilate said, behold the man, whom I spake to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. So in his innocence, Saul represents the great king who is higher than the others. And uh, he represents the one who has a meek spirit because Saul originally had a meek spirit, as we will find out. And he represents some of those attributes. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate. So there is again you have the, the concept of judgment. And said, tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is, because he didn't know he was speaking to Samuel. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and I will tell thee all that is in thy heart. Uh, where else did we hear that statement? Where else was there a lady who ran to, a, to her city and said, I have found a man, and he has told me all that is in my heart. Now, Saul was looking for asses. That was in his heart. But he got more than he bargained for. I'm sure that Samuel told him a lot more than just that the asses had been found. All that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? There's a beautiful parallel there as well. The desire of Israel. Oh, we have one of the greatest books in the world in our 
midst. It's called the desire of ages. He said, not on thee and on all thy father's house. So there were noble aspirations in this choice. Saul was the tallest. He was of great stature. He was the firstborn of the Benjamites. His father was a mighty man of valor. That man's father was called Father God. It's an interesting, it's an interesting story. And the next king, he's a sheep herder. And he's the youngest of the children. And his statue was, stature was youthful and ruddy. Not like Saul. He was also a mighty man, but he had different aspirations. He was seeking the virtue of God. Who is this Philistine, he said, that he should defy the armies of the living God. And this man is looking for asses. So Saul answers when he, when he hears these words, he doesn't fully comprehend them. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my father the least of all the families of the tribes of Israel, of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So here was an aspect of humility that disappeared later. And Samuel took Saul and his servants and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. Now it's not 30 days or anything of that nature, it's 30 persons. The number 30 is very interesting in the Bible because if you were a, a priest, you can only start working when you were 30 years old. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. So here is a, is a suggestion of a ministry. He's sitting amongst these 30 people that represent those that are of preaching age. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring me the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, Set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder... And that which was upon it and set it before Saul. Okay, let's read that again. And the cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it and set it before Saul. Now the shoulder of a meat offering was used for the wave offering. So it was a very special portion some Bibles get it absolutely wrong. Uh, the Afrikaans Bible in South Africa have it uh, the leg of mutton. I assume it's because they are so partial to it that they couldn't believe that it could be the shoulder. But the correct translation is the, soul, the shoulder. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says the following, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it has to be the shoulder because the government was going to be on his shoulder. But Israel had been warned as to what the state of affairs was if God was rejected and a king was put in place of God. So he receives the shoulder. He must have wondered, what is happening? And that which was upon it, well, maybe there was some food upon it or whatever, but what was spiritually upon it was the government. The government was going to be upon his shoulders. 
And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, I set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time has it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. He internalized the responsibility. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, oh, now we're going down. Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. So he's still a little bit up. He goes to the roof. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day. Now, when they say they arose early, what they did normally when they arise early, they go and they saddle and pack the donkeys, the beasts of burden. So they went down, and they prepared for their journey home. That Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, now they're down again, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while that I may show thee the word of God. Stand thou still a while. How do we find the word of God? By standing still a while. We must take time to stand still a while. So he comes from the tribe of Benjamin. He's the last. The second king comes from the tribe of Judah. The kingdom starts with the lowest and ascends to the highest. And uh, the virtues of Benjamin were the lowest of all the tribes. That's why the asses were gone. Remember what Benjamin did and why they were the smallest of all the tribes? How they had sided with the wicked men who had shamefully treated the wife of the traveler who had come up from Bethlehem. There's another beautiful type in that story. And how the whole tribe was virtually wiped out as a consequence. And uh, there was no virtue. The virtue was gone. And when you think about Jesus, and you think about the relationships the sheep, the lost asses. Jesus has a parable where he talks about the lost sheep. And the lost sheep, of course, are people. People that are lost. So the lost sheep represent the people and the spiritual virtues, the higher cognitive virtues that have to be restored. And the lost asses represent the lost principles. The government is on his shoulder. The head is mentioned from the shoulder upwards. This is the seat of wisdom. Now, prophets and judges rode on donkeys. Princes, sons of kings, rode on asses. And kings normally had horses running before them. So there was a hierarchy. The asses of Saul's father were lost. Jesus also has a story about an ass. But to Jesus, the ass is not lost. Jesus sends two of his disciples to go and fetch an ass that is tied up. And his disciples take it because the Lord has need of it. And he brings it. Jesus knows exactly where the asses are. And they bring the ass. And Jesus climbs onto the ass. And he goes into Jerusalem being hailed the Messiah. So in the very act of climbing upon an ass. And remember the ass was highly esteemed in those days. 
prophets, judges, rode on asses. Here is the great antitypical judge, the great antitypical prophet, and he sits on an ass. And the ass is led by a personage. And that person is in all likelihood Lazarus, who had been resurrected from the dead. You see, those virtues have to be found again. They have to be restored to their original situation. And only Christ, riding on the donkey, can show the way of restoring that which has been lost to all humanity. So the ass is the natural, the earthly. The sheep is the spiritual. Now it's interesting that uh, the spiritual must have control over the natural. We read in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, For the Son, have, Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And we know that the lost sheep was lost. But if you notice the grammar there, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost lost. It doesn't say them that were lost. That is neuter. It's not personal. There's more that, in, that is lost than just people that are lost. Yes, I am lost. You are lost. And if we are not found by the great shepherd, we will remain lost. But there's so much more in us that is lost. All our virtues are lost. They've become perverted. We cannot find them. We cannot set them in the right pathway. We cannot restore ourselves. The asses are lost. And it takes a higher power to restore them. That which was lost. It includes us, but it also has a much higher connotation. Now, the kings of Canaan, they all ruled. And they represent those virtues which have become so distorted that they need to be destroyed. God permits a king in Israel. And through the kings, he wants to teach us a lesson. And so when you go through the story of Israel, you have a bad king, beginning with Saul. He starts off well and deteriorates. And then you have David. And David is the spiritual man. Saul always repented in sackcloth and ashes, but his repentance was always for his loss. Whereas David his repentance was always sorrow for his sin. So you have these two aspects always contrasting each other. And uh, it's really quite an amazing story. Saul did not know Samuel when he came to see him, but Samuel knew him in the same way. We don't know Jesus Christ when we come to see him. We don't know what he is like, but he knows us. He knows every single aspect about us. He knows what we are, what virtues we no longer possess in any shape or form. He knows exactly how to restore us. He knows where to find them. He knows where to put them into right relationship. And uh, we meet him in the gate, in the judgment. So we meet him as a consequence of justice and law. And the Bible tells us that the law is the mirror. And when I look into the mirror, I see myself for what I am, and I'm constrained to say that I'm lost. And Wesley puts it so beautifully. He says, I cannot be without the law for one moment. Because the law drives me to Christ. And I cannot be without Christ for one moment because Christ restores 
that which was lost, that virtue, that moral barometer, he restores it, and then he sends me back to the law. So the two send each other backwards to the form of justice, to the law. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 7 and 15 says, well, let's read first verse 7. For the Egyptian shall help in vain and to no purpose. No point going to the Egyptian for help. He can't help you. It's interesting that when, when Saul came to Lut, he said, let's turn back. If it wasn't for the servant who said, no, no, no. In this place there's a seer. And he can tell us. Yeah, but I've got nothing to offer. What are, what is, he's arguing just like I used to argue. No, no, no. We don't have much, but let's just go and see him. The Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. And to make the verses quite clear, Let's read it in verse 15, Isaiah 30. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And then the sad words, and you would not. So how do we restore that which is lost? How do we get the asses back? that are gone. We have to go to the seer. We have to go up. We have to listen to the advice of the women at the well that take the living water and disseminate it. And we have to ask ourselves a question. How do I restore this? Who's going to help me? Am I going to work at it? Perhaps I can go to a psychiatrist. Perhaps he can help me. Perhaps I can go to a therapist. Perhaps he can help me. No. In quietness and rest you shall be saved. What rest? Rest in the completed work of God. Righteousness by faith is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And let us not add the verses, and ye would not. Isaiah 52 verse 13 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Fortunately, this is not an earthly king. As many were astonished at thee, his vision was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. There was nothing to attract. The Jews looked at him, and they looked at him with disdain. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Some called him the bastard son. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouth at him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Through all the lessons of the kings and the kings that we are under today, the only task that we have in their presence is to tell them, come and see. Come up higher. Let's go up. Let's go and see. Who shall be our king? Isaiah chapter 33, verse 13. Hear ye that are afar off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who amongst us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who amongst us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? We always get that one wrong. We always put the bad people in the hot place and the good people in uh, the cold place. Wrong way around. We're going to stand on a lake of fire and we, will be con we would be consumed if there was a sin attached to us. 
if the righteousness of Christ wouldn't cover us. Just like those in the, in the furnace, we will stand in the presence of God without being consumed. And then it tells us, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppression, that shaketh the hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. And if I look at that list, and I look at the kings of the world today, how many of the kings today seek gain, seek oppression, shake the hands of those that hold bribes? You can look at any one of them. They're all going before the courts because of corruption. And there is no justice in this world. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be in the munition of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. And they shall behold the land that is very far off. The only one who can take us to that land that is very far or far removed from our fallen nature is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who knows where the ass is. He's the only one that can ride it and lead it back into a glorified state. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? How much strength do I have? Do I have enough military power to blow away the Russians or the Syrians or whatever. Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of a deeper speech than thou canst perceive of a stammering tongue that thou canst understand. There will be no Babylonians. There will be no foreign language. There will only be the language of Zion. Look upon Zion, the city of the Solomites. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. Who? The Lord. A place of broad rivers and streams. Wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ships pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our Lord give, lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. I think God permits this turmoil on this earth that humanity can look up and long for something better. Who's going to be the servant to say, come let us go and see the seer? Are we going to do it? For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Verse 23, thy tacklings are loosed. They could not well strengthen thy mast. They could not spread the sail. Then is the prey of the great spoil divided, and the lame taken take the prey. And the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. I long for the time when this king will rule. I cannot wait. And I cannot understand how people can say, please, not yet. Why not now? We want to go home. Let's be like the servant of Saul. Let's say, come, let us go. It doesn't matter whether you have bread or what you have. Come, let us go higher. Kings will come to this message. People will be converted if we are like that servant. May God bless us as we contemplate these things. Okay, I believe you have been blessed by this message from Professor Waterfaith. And I have some of the comments. And some are negative comments, a little bit. I don't usually focus on criticizing or finding the weakness in the presentation or summons. I don't like it. Why? Because I want people to know what is good, okay? But there are things which I 
think and this someone I have to give the comments um, just like criticism okay uh, in a matter of showing the the need for us to be careful with the, those things but many things in this sermon which has been presented by Professor Walter Veith has been good. And in interpretation, the aspect that he has done best, especially on the issue of application, and some in the issue of uh, history or the background of the text. And there are things that we have to work better on on this presentation, especially on the issue of application the issue of waiting upon the Lord, the issue of trusting God, the issue of doing uh, what we have to do, the way he has used the, uh, the text from the, the, the Bible, text from the book of uh, Psalm chapter 15 from verse 1, where who is going to stay under the shadow of the Lord Almighty? And uh, he has given those qualities. Okay, I believe you know that verse... Okay, the book of Psalm chapter 15, I think it's the best that he has used it. Who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? Okay, he has used it better. So we have things that we can learn from this presentation to work on. I've applauded it, I've used it all without cutting it short because I found it was connected. There was no any piece that has to be omitted. Uh, and the person to get the message. So I had to let it all message to be presented. And then after that to find what I can add is the things which have been burst and some we used the, uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 where it says, For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, less shall he be saved in quietness and shall confidence shall be your strength. I will not whiten upon the Lord Given the examples and the differences between these two kings, David and um, Saul, that's, that is good. That's, that's fine. Okay, that's good spiritually. It helps us to know the differences and to know which at least we can get more lessons from. But there are things that I need to make clear. And, is, and this is from the way Adventists are to interpret the scriptures. There are methods in interpretation of scriptures since when Israelites uh, were in existence, okay? There have been more ways to interpret the scriptures. But we know Adventists, we use the method that Jesus Christ used it and what the apostles used it and what Nehemiah and other, uh, other prophets used it and also we go even to Jesus have said and Adventists and William Miller and Martin Luther and other uh, other Protestants. They use it the method which we call historical grammatical method, which focuses on finding the little intention of the author, considering the historical background of the text, and then we go on to find what is what the text means, the issue of grammar, and uh, the real meaning of the text, then we go to application. But the weakness that I've formed, which is a very, it's, if you use it lightly, it can bring you good meaning, and, but sometimes it can make you lose the track of the interpretation of the scripture. He has really some of the issue of translating everything with the spiritual meaning. Almost in the history of Saul, uh, where he has gone, where he went, and this what happened about asses, about the, the, the meat that he got, that's, a, that's a, of the shoulder. Yes, that's how it says. Using every, almost everything in the, Bib and in the spiritual aspect, finding the spiritual aspect of everything, uh, even the praises, it's a little bit dangerous when you take it to, you take it and you start to read every verse to find a spiritual meaning. And if you use this, you are going to fall under the false way of interpreting the scripture, which Adventists we don't use, and that is Alexandrian hermeneutics, uh, 
where interpretation has almost five parts. You start with, let me if I'm going to, there is history, there is doctrine, there is prophetic, okay, which uh, makes things to go not okay. Let me find it. Uh, this method, Alexandrian hermeneutics, has five things: and uh, historical, uh, doctrinal, prophetic, philosophical, and mystical. Where they use it to to to, to translate to interpret the scripture using these things. And many churches, especially uh, evangelical churches, have used this. That if you interpret the scripture. When it says he was walking and a person goes, that's not walking. Walking spiritually means doing this. And when he slept, sleeping means this. Not all text has to be interpreted spiritually. Like everything. That's why we have to use what was the intention of the scripture, of the, of the original writer. Okay? What did he intend us to understand? Okay? And that is when we fetch the message which can help us. The danger of using other message, you go out, you go, it makes you go a little bit distance from the authority of the scripture. The more you come across to the real meaning of the scripture, is the more you can that makes you to have more authority over the scripture. But if you go far distant, trying to find spiritual meaning in everything, it makes you lose the intention of God. For example, in this story of Saul, what was the intention of the scripture, of the author? There are two authors. There is the first author, who is the Holy Spirit, but the second author, who is the only writer, okay? But what was the intention of the second author? What did he want us to learn? If you read the war story, you find you wanted to, uh, to learn something. And the way we interpret historical narratives is mostly historical narratives do not focus on people, but they focus on showing how God reacted or did something toward his people, showing the power, supernatural power, intervention of God. So historical narratives that uh, have the basic on that to show what God did, not mostly focusing on what people did because the writers knew that people were weak, so they focusing more on God, and so that's what we want to find. Okay, and yes, we don't have to forget that there were people, but what was the intention of the author is to show us that people rejected God, they wanted the king, and the stubbornness of their hearts. Okay, in the matter of the of people, stubbornness of their heart, but God intervening by at least keeping giving them the king, the first king, then he gave them the second king, that is David, that God still did not forsake them, regardless of their weakness of choosing the king. Still God was with them, though he told them the wickedness that the king they desired would uh, would do. And not only about the king, but also about the system that they wanted of the government. And so that was the intention of the author. Does, does this disqualify the things that Professor Walter Vetha said? Absolutely not. Because in the issue of application, he has did a lot which were good. That's why I say the message was packed. We have things to learn. We have things to apply. Okay, and that is very important. And so, my friend, I encourage you to keep studying your Bible. And when you read and when you listen to sermons, you have to have your own Bible and to go along with the preacher. Don't just listen and then you take everything the preacher says or any method the preacher uses to deliver. We need to be keen to know that this. We are not perfect. Actually, we are not perfect. And so, even if a pastor may have been studied, see, there are things that it can go a little bit uh, far. So, we need that actually to learn, to keep learning, to keep presenting the messages. Myself, the way I do things, 
I don't believe I'm perfect and anybody can criticize, okay? And uh, that's why I don't focus on criticizing the summons. I don't. It's just this one because I've seen that so if somebody takes this method and use it in Bible study, he's going to miss the point. If he chooses that, wow, this is how we start the Bible because I have heard Professor Walter Weiss using if it's a shoulder, if it's the this, if it's the us, if it's the this, if it's this. And so when he keeps studying the Bible, he's going to do the same thing, the same method. That's why I've said, hey, you have to be, you have to be keen that Adventists we use historical grammatical method. And I've explained how it is. And Walter Faith, he has used it, but he has, been, he has shifted a little to go to Alexandrian hermeneutics, which it has some of the things which are right, but it had some of the things which are bad, which are not good, in the matter of it can lead you to go to wrong interpretation of the scripture. And so I believe I've been blessed. Not focus more on the new things. Actually, what I've, sp I've spoken is just to add to you. But still, I welcome you to keep watching the sermons because I want to share what I watch and uh, what I'm watching and what I'm studying. I just watch with you. I don't watch and then come and show you that that just a matter of showing. But I share with you what I'm watching, what I'm, I'm watching the sermons because I like more sermons. And so by doing this, I share with you the knowledge and I give my comments and through that, at least you can, we can grow together, okay, in this spiritual journey. And um, the Bible is so sweet if we study it and if we, you, we do application of what the text requires us to do. And then you come close to God. The more you come close to the original meaning of the text, the more you have a, a divine authority in the matter of you come close to the intention of God. And that is very important. And that is what Jesus Christ used it. And so I, I encourage you to keep studying, to keep reading this sermon. Yes, it hasn't changed the text, the, the, the channel title. But visiting this channel, I believe by God's grace, we are, gonna, we are going to grow spiritually, knowing more uh, Jesus Christ and preparing ourselves to go, uh, for the second coming of Jesus. So may God bless you. Amen.